All right. So Hillary Mason, co-founder at Hidden Door and founder at Fast Forward Labs, previously Fast Forward Labs, uh, which became part of Cloudera. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. And uh, Hillary is not only an amazing data scientist, but as you can tell, she's great at naming companies. So Hidden Door <laughs> and Fast Forward. I always love that name, Fast Forward Lab. Thank you. We got uh, a, um, a free association with the Fast Forward button that um, you know people don't think about it every day, but it's something that snuck into our vocabulary. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a good, that one was a good name. So let's start with Hidden Door. I checked on Twitter. The tagline is social role-playing powered by narrative AI. So what is Hidden Door? So at Hidden Door, we are building the technical capability to take any novel, screenplay, TV show, movie, and make it a playable role-playing game. So if you're the fan of one of these kinds of experiences, you can grab your friends and then on the web, so you're playing on an app together, um, role play, just like you're in a, any sort of tabletop RPG where you have a character, you're deciding what those characters do together um, in order to explore a world through story. Um, and as you play, you and your friends together are creating more of that world. So we have a narrative AI system that is based on a ton of fun NLP that is live generating art and text that describes what happens. So another way we like to think about it is that it's sort of like um, a story where you might want to decide that your character can do literally anything. And then the system is improvising along with you as if you were at a really great improv show and you threw out a few words and you're getting some unique uh, response back. So, so before we proceed further, for the people who are not familiar with the term role-playing game, what is a role-playing game? Ah, so a role-playing game is a type of story-based game where you make up a character that exists in a world. So you could imagine that if you love, you know, wizarding boarding school, you would decide what kind of wizard you want to be. You might make some trade-offs. Are you really smart? Are you really clever? Are you really charismatic? Um, and then you're set in a scenario where you're, you're given a story and an objective. So like, oh, you wake up one day, you're in potions class, and there is a mysterious device on the table. What do you do? And you can do anything. So you can jump out the window, you can try to destroy the device, you can go make friends with it. Um, and typically role-playing games are narrated by a person who is then improvising what happens next along with you. And then there are a set of rules and mechanics where you might roll dice to see whether you succeed or fail at an action. And it's really fun, not just because of the gameplay, but because it's a social experience where you, know, you and your friends are able to have this kind of adventure together that is just something that doesn't usually happen. And, real life. And I also say this as a, you know, I've played so many role-playing games and probably lost way too many hours to it in college. Um, so it's, it's also had a big impact on me personally, this kind of play. And as you're describing it, it becomes clear why some of the AI technology that uh, we hear about might be useful for creating Absolutely. role-playing games. So, so describe what is the user interface or workflow for Hidden Door? Like, where do you begin? So I have a script. <laughs> I have a script for a, a movie. Then what? Well, oh, so let's start if you're a player. Because as a player, you come in and you can find out more about this on our website, hiddendoor.co. We have a video walkthrough and stuff. Um, but as a player, you decide what kind of story you want to play today. And so you get to pick the world you're playing in. You get to make some choices. I want a hopeful story. I want a story about a cat. I want a story that takes place on a pirate ship. Whatever it is, you sort of throw those ingredients in. And we have a, a bunch of cards you choose. And those are basically dealing out the deck that will define your story. Um, you make a character. So you decide who you want to be in that story. You invite your friends to do the same. And then you're thrown into that story adventure. And we ask you to make choices about what your character does in response to what the system sets up. And the whole thing reads like a graphic novel. So it looks like a two-dimensional graphic novel, but it's all dynamically generated, the text, the art, the composition, based on your choices and what you decide ought to happen next. And uh, so let's say I create this game. 
and mm -hmm. me and my friends enjoy it, can we go back and play it again? You cannot play the exact same thing again, but your characters, you can play a campaign. So your characters can go on another story or related story. Um, they can extend the world they're in through playing. You can create new adventures and bring your friends along with you. Um, or you could try throwing the same ingredients in again, but it is a probabilistic process. You won't get out exactly the same thing the second time. And another thing I'll add is that your characters evolve as you play. So they get more powerful, they get new toys, new stuff, new items, new loot to play with. Um, and so it isn't the sort of thing where you go back. They're always progressing. They're always making decisions that have meaningful impacts on where the, the world goes. Um, so there's more of it, but it's not a, it's not a do it and then do it again the same way sort of game. So before Hidden Door, the people who created role-playing games, some of them had reputations for creating very good RPGs, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have kind of, you're giving them extra superpowers to take their create, uh, creativity to another level in many ways, right? Yes. So, I mean, just to say this another way, we really see the advantages of our machine learning system as being able to um, be a co-creative tool for people who want to have these sorts of adventures where if you want to play this sort of game right now, you have to get all your friends around a table or around a Zoom at the same time. And you have to have one friend who's going to do all the work of planning out where the story might go enforcing the rules and the laws of physics. And then as the players make decisions that don't quite follow the plan, uh, improvising and adapting. And the people who are great at this are amazing at it and create these incredible experiences. Um, but it's hard and it takes a lot of work to do well. And so what we're doing here is creating a system that can play part of this role um, in a more automated asynchronous way. Uh, just to, you know, allow more people to have this sort of experience and for people who already want to have this experience to give them yet another way to uh, show off their world building skills. So what, uh, so what uh, machine learning models are you folks uh, uh, leaning on? Many. Um, and I will say, you know, one of the things we're doing that is perhaps a little bit uh, controversial is that this is not a one model to rule them all sort of situation. Like we're not trying to train the ultimate deep learning model that can do everything. Instead, we are pragmatically decomposing our problem and building tons of composable models and systems that we can assemble together at runtime for a bunch of reasons, um, but largely because we care a lot about having uh, editorial control over what happens in the stories and having them be very interpretable. And so just to explain that another way, um, I'm sure folks are imagining that we're using large language models and we are indeed, but we are not using them in the sense of putting raw text in getting raw text out and passing that back to a player. We don't do that. Instead, we have a system where you can input anything. So unstructured input in, it gets structured into what we call our game state. So a structured representation of what's in the world at any given time. We have an actual game engine, like a simulation. There are uh, you know, statistical challenges that go on in the back end. Like, did you succeed at that action? Are you strong enough to lift that boulder? All that sort of stuff. And we take the resulting game structure that comes out of that simulation engine, and then we render that dynamically in text and art. And that gives us a couple of affordances that you wouldn't see using just one big model, at least not today, which is one that we have control over what happens and we can write logical rules about it or, or probabilistic rules classifiers. Um, we have the ability to um, combine sort of the, uh, hand curated effects with machine generated ones. And we're dynamically able to reflect the game in any perspective. So if, as you're playing the game, you always see it from your character's perspective. You do this, your friend does this, um, but everyone sees it that way. And then at the end of a, a story, it gets rendered in third person for everyone to see as well. So there's a little bit of a magic trick there where you always see everything from your perspective. Um, but that's because we're taking that structured game state and rendering it dynamically. 
we are using a bunch of language models, but we are doing that in a way that is mostly offline um, and gives us, again, that degree of control, um, which is important for safety and then for consistency and for the general game experience. So how does your model improve and learn over time? Because it's a bit of a, this is not, there's no, uh, it's not like a classic machine learning problem where you go, yeah, the model got it right. That's right. There is no notion of quantitative correctness for how a multiplayer story should be generated or what the plot ought to be. Um, so we think about this in a couple of ways. So I should say that most of our models are um, fine-tuned or trained off of a corpus of over a million stories we've collected. Um, so there's a lot of curation of that underlying data to be of the right genre, subgenre, um, to help us understand the kinds of plots that happen. That's one piece. And the second piece is that the product itself is a data product, which is something I always like to define as a product where not only could it not exist without that underlying data set, but as people use the product, uh, it gets better over time. And so as people are presented with different scenarios and make different choices, we are using that to improve the kinds of scenarios and responses that are presented. And we do that in a bunch of systems, so along our vocabulary system, in terms of our plot, in terms of how our NPCs or non-player characters behave in the system around you. Um, we have a narrator, and who you know can propel the story forward, can sort of gently redirect things. Um, and then we have a, a bunch of um, areas where we look for how, how people respond to the system's choices. So some of these things, uh, we've done a lot of play testing and sometimes it's not even obvious what a, the system should do. So to give you an example, we had a player in a play test session and there was a robbery they were supposed to stop the robbers. And instead of, you know, trying to approach them or talking to them or any of the set of things we sort of had other play testers doing, this one decides they're going to tickle the street. So I was watching this thinking, what should happen? Should the street come to life and now become an ally? Should the, should we just say, no, you, you do it, but the street does nothing. It is a street. Um, and all of this sort of thing is configurable on a, a world by world, adventure by adventure basis. Like how comedic is this world? How responsive should we be to the player's sort of random ideas? Um, and so we're dialing in and tuning that based on our player behavior. So that is the long answer to a, a fairly straightforward question, but I hope it gives you a bigger picture. So there, so there must be uh, uh, elements in your UX where the players are helping you improve? I am, and this is speaking more broadly than just yeah. our product, I yeah. am a very big fan of using implicit behavior in a product versus yeah. explicitly asking someone, was this a good result? Because people never know, and they're annoyed. Um, so we have designed many places where we're getting that implicit feedback. So looking at the way someone responds to something, if they're continuing you know, to play more in a story after we've presented certain choices, um, all that sort of stuff versus trying to be very explicit about it. But I know that's a controversial area. So I expect I'll probably get some comments from folks who may, uh, may disagree with me on that. So would Hidden Door have been possible five, six years ago? Absolutely not. We are right at the beginning of the technical capability to even start to do this. And uh, so, so you mentioned large language models. So are there elements from computer vision? like GANs and so what, so besides language, so what other, what other key things, key building blocks do you need? So we are doing a lot around, I mean, it, it's very NLP heavy and even our art is uh, using language as the interface. So just to describe that a bit, um, let's say you ask for a magnificent uh, chef as a character that will go into our dictionary and we will see like, oh, we have, you know, a, um, you know, cook's hat. We maybe we don't have a chef's hat. And so we're doing a bunch of um, custom trained word to vec models in that case to be able to dynamically assemble a set of art assets and then combine them into a visual that makes sense given the, the text. So text is really the interface there. Um, but there's a bunch of that so stuff. Similar to this uh, Dolly from OpenAI. It's, 
in it's, the sense that the, the text, they also yes. use text, right? So. so the input is text and the output is an image. Our system is essentially a layered set of paper dolls that can be combined in many, you know, many, many permutations and combinations. And each of those was uh, crafted for the purpose. So it's a little bit, Dolly can produce literally anything. We have a lot of control over what comes out of our system. Um, but but again, you, can, can you, you can imagine if you had access to something Dolly in the like Dolly in the future, you would you might use it too. I mean, someday, yes. And in fact, I don't see right now our system creates the sort of 2D graphic novel um, experiences. I don't see any reason it can be a 3D space that is dynamically pulled together based on language as well someday. So what, uh, what are you doing in terms of data privacy and, and things like this? Because basically RPGs, you're, like you said, you're, you're kind of collecting data in some ways. So I do uh, want to be very clear on what data we're collecting because yeah, our yeah. system is architected to allow players as young as nine to be compliant with every policy and legal um, legal framework for having the world. Throughout the world. Yes, I mean we're we're yeah. currently uh, U.S. only for partially for those reasons, but, yeah. but we've been designing this in from the beginning. Um, and that means, for example, we collect no PII. So our systems have no idea who you are or where you are really. Um, and so as we are collecting data about play sessions and choices that are made, like maybe we present you with a palette of options and you pick out of that and we will you know, log that to improve the algorithm. Um, we are not at all interested in analyzing people's behavior, demographics beyond that. Um, and part of making a system that is safe for players this young is also being able to make sure the content they see is safe. Um, and so in spite of using you know, things like large language models, we only use them in an offline way and nothing that gets shown to a player has not had a set of human eyes pass over it. Um, and that is to say we're able to do dynamic generation using somewhat more interpretable techniques. Um, so it is all dynamically generated, but that was a very deliberate choice we made to make sure that we could build a system um, that would be for all ages. So you men you've alluded to using mil millions of stories. So mm -hmm. what what do you mean by that? Where did you get these stories? <laughs> what do you, where did you get the stories, and what do you mean by using millions of stories? Well, it's um, you know, have you been on the internet? There are lots of stories out there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and we are, you know, very uh, eagerly building on top of a lot of the, the open book data that things like uh, GPT-3 and other language models are building on top of as well. Um, we are not using... But the... is it, uh, Hillary, is it a certain genre of stories? Like, uh, they're not like uh, 18th century novels or anything... There might yep. be a couple of those in there, but no, we um we have a lot of uh, fan fiction in the data set. We have a fair bit of um like uh, play by writing RPG playthroughs, um, you know, and it, it's fiction, which is important. And also, uh, we um are looking for fiction across many different subgenres. So one of the things we ask creators to do when they import a world or build a new one is to say, give us a recipe. Is this like 80% technopunk, 20% comedy science fiction. And from that, we pull things like the vocabulary to use, to the kinds of art styles, the laws of physics, like how comedic is a world? Is there death? Is there magic? Um, or is it superpowers? Or is it, you know, techno powers or whatever it is? Um, whereas, whereas before, if you're a creator, you just have to either have a catalog that you wrote down somewhere, yeah. right? And, and now you, you folks are basically giving them access to uh, many more, right? So. Yeah, and I can show you some cool visualizations of the use of language by subgenre in science fiction, for example. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can link to that or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then uh, have you then uh, in the course of, in the, course of uh, the short history of Hidden Door, are you beginning to identify kind of, kind of some of these really power creators just to, to 
I mean, except, we... except, exceptional creators. And, how, and yeah. how would you define them? So they would be the people who create RPGs that have a lot of engagement, right? So we are just at the beginning, and I would say we are looking for those people. So should any of them be listening, I would love to hear from them. And the way I would define them is to say that the people who we think are most successful are people who have um, a skill in world building. Um, and that is a skill related to, but distinct from, say, writing an amazing novel. Many of them are novelists and they're quite successful, but people who really think about designing and building out a world and all the different factions in a world and the kinds of people and the kinds of, you know, trouble they might get into and the kinds of situations that may come up. Um, so those are the people we are looking for, and we are currently um, just starting to work with some of them. So I'd, I'd say this is a good good moment to put up that flag and say that if you are one or you know one, we would love to talk to them. So so if uh, th this is the reason why I asked about the the replay question, right? So if uh -huh. I create an RPG that uh, on Hidden Door that seems to be really uh, engaging a lot of people, and then people start playing it, who owns that IP? Ah, the creator does. So, okay. and we are also exploring financial models where they would be compensated for that. And just to give you an idea of how it works, they create that world in our system. It's an asynchronous process. And then players come along and they create essentially a fork of the world that's theirs. And then they and their friends, as they play, they extend it. But the system is configured such that the creator's sort of vision is preserved by the options that are presented to the players. Um, so as players play, the world gets bigger, maybe new locations are generated, but that all comes um, from the creator and the system and the players together. So what is the origin story of Hidden Door? I, I almost sense like this is something you've been wanting to build for 10 years. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> um, like I said before, as a, an undergrad, I studied creative writing and computer science, and I played a ton of role-playing games um, and have always really been fascinated by this idea of using machine learning as a tool for augmenting creativity and specifically fiction. And a lot of the things that are liabilities in places where we want to apply these technologies, like I've worked on several systems and things like customer support, um, the fact that they can hallucinate um, becomes an asset when you apply it to fiction and to play. Um, and as I also said earlier, we are right at the beginning of being able to actually um, have this technical capability in a state where we can start to invent the experience around it. And so that's what I'm really excited about is that um, it is an opportunity for us to take this kind of energy where people very much want to live inside these worlds. And we see it everywhere in fan fiction communities and role-playing games. We see it in the, even things like Disney with their galactic star cruiser, where you can live action role play, like you're in star Wars for a couple of days. Um, like there's tons of this energy out there and we just haven't had the ability to do it through this sort of technically mediated asynchronous way. Um, and so, yes, now is the time to build this. And I'm really excited that I get to be a part of it. And by the way, we've built a wonderful team that's sort of half folks from tech and, and machine learning and half folks from gaming too. Um, so that's also been a lot of fun. You know, what's, uh, uh, interesting about this is that, uh, when I talk to, uh, uh, people out here in Silicon Valley and, uh, uh, engineers and ML people, a lot of them. I mean, naturally, they build things that they would use themselves. So inevitably, mm -hmm. it's some kind of horizontal general purpose tool that, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, then you have, you're into this enterprise software world, which, you know, none of them have the background on how to sell those products to enterprises. Right? And, and so then, then uh, uh, and then recently, a friend of mine and I uh, uh, started digging into, you know, what are the really big startups in AI? And almost all of them are not horizontal. They're all like uh, very specific, you know, sales tools or marketing tools and and things That's like right. that. But but then all our friends build things that are not in those areas somehow. 
Well, I think you've hit on something there, right? Which is that if you think of where you can actually get the leverage to build a differentiated, non-commoditizable AI product, it's probably in something where you can build the world's best model for X, so something very deep. Um, but if you're thinking about yeah, if you're, you know, day to day sort of thinking about what's the piece of infrastructure that everybody right. building data pipelines needs, you're going to end up building all of this something. is very important. All yes, of this is at another important. slice of the stack. And I also agree, and I can say this from personal experience, when I started Fast Forward Labs, um, I did not know how to sell to like the global Fortune 500, who ended up being most of our customers. And a lot of companies and founders do end up building something technically amazing and then having to learn how to sell it, which is another skill set. And you definitely, if you are one of those people, you should do it, but it's it's hard. But in, in your case, you combine uh, multiple interests that you had and you just decided, hey, this is the time to, I can build something that combines multiple uh, things that I'm interested in. That's absolutely true. Um, uh -huh. Yes. And I think I think maybe uh, people should start kind of broadening their lens into what they can build at, at this point. What do you think? So I think that there is a tremendous opportunity given some of the underlying ML and AI capabilities that are emerging in things like computer vision and things like NLP in particular, where I'm very excited. Um, that is opening up these opportunities that are not recognized. And thinking of, um, I saw an article a few weeks ago that I can't get out of my head because it was arguing like there are billion dollar businesses to be built here. But then it tried to list some examples and all of the examples in the article were things that already exist, but now they can be done cheaper. I'm like that's just step one. Yeah. That, the, the next step, which we haven't gotten to yet is to explore the space of things that could never be done before that are now possible or that could have been done before, but at such great expense that they just weren't practical. Um, and so I really do think we are poised in one of those moments where we're waiting for people to find, to invent the products around some of these ML capabilities, but those sorts of, uh, lots of people have the ideas and have the inspiration. But it's actually really hard to to um, to bring the right sets of people together in the right space, in the right business context, with the right customers, with the right business model, with the right investors to like make that actually happen. So I feel like there's this flowering of good ideas everywhere, and uh, it's actually harder to do this than it should be. But now is the time to try. So so uh, we first met in the very very early days of data science, which would probably be. It was years a long ago. time ago. 10 years ago now or more, right? Yeah. And so two questions. One, do you still identify as a data scientist? And secondly, uh, how, how do you feel about data science now? The state of data okay. science. Yeah, yeah. So my personal background is in machine learning. And so I feel like I have always identified as a technologist with a business hobby. And certainly with a data science machine learning spin on that. Um, and yes, I still identify that way, even though um, now I'm, I'm, well, I still write some code. So, yeah. you know, I'm still doing a bunch of that work myself too. Um, so there's that. And then how do I feel about data science? Yeah, I from, from, that... uh, from where we were 10, 12 years ago when we started to now. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a few things that surprise me, but I haven't lost hope. And so if you'd asked me, and I think you probably did 12 years ago or whatever it was, um, what I thought was going to change is a couple of things. Um, for one thing, I thought the profession would be a little more defined. So right now, if you're a software engineer, it's pretty much the same job description. You sit in the same place in the org, you have the same career path at any of the tech companies. Um, for data science, it is not the same. Right. So data science can sit in a bunch of different places. The career path is weird. Like the skills that are required at any level are weird, weird or different or quirky. And every organization is, is different. Um, and the operating models are different. Like maybe you're on a product team, maybe you're on a team of only data scientists, like 
it's all over the map. And so every navigating every job is a, a new and exciting thing for people. And there's very, I thought we would have settled that by now. And, um, and then Hillary, the, uh, the proliferation of data science programs, not just in uh, industry, but in universities hasn't, hasn't really corrected that, right? I mean, no. Because because if you look at the if you look at like you said data science in LinkedIn, there's a data scientist that does SQL, mm -hmm. right? So, and then there's a data scientist that we think of as doing machine learning. Right. right? But and, they're both, and I will they're say both, that like they both have the same title, right? So. Yes, and that hasn't that shows no signs of settling, and I would like it to because this is very. <laughs> confusing, particularly for people who are trying to navigate a career at the beginning right. of a career, um, when maybe you don't have the, why, the sort why of experience the, leverage. The, the fact that universities have these programs in other disciplines, as you point out, that, that has led to some kind of formalization and standardization. I don't know that, that universities, right. like what do university computer science programs have to do with the way software engineering That's is true. practiced? That's I think true. it's much yeah. more an industry uh, sort yeah. of and then the second thing I'll say is that 12 years ago, data science was so new that we were able to get in a lot more trouble. Um, whereas now I do feel like um, it, it's been cursed a bit with the need to like find an objective function and optimize it, which takes a whole class of problems. Like for example, the ones we're working on off the table because they right. are not problems that have a quantifiable objective function. And then at the same time, we're now seeing this increasing pressure. Like you can't just have a data science team around to do cool prototypes. Like companies actually want some value out of that. Um, and because of perhaps some of this chaos, like it's very hard to manage it well. Um, and so I think we are seeing also we're in this point in the evolution of the field and the job and the capability where companies are sort of taking that step back or leadership is and being like, you're not the shiny new toy anymore. Like, what are you doing for me actually? Um, and so there, there's a bit of that. Um, yeah, we, we need the uh, people are, are going, these data scientists, they're not helping us uh, uh, push things to production. We need this other group of people. They're called machine learning engineers. <laughs> well, right, and they're all the same people. And I, I do wanna say that one thing, yeah even though you mentioned university programs, one thing I've always loved about working in the broad umbrella of data science, whether you're data engineer, data analyst, machine learning engineer, AI, and whatever you are, people come to it from such interesting backgrounds um, and bring to it um, just sort of skills and experience that um, like, I think that if you're building a data science team until you're at like 25 people, every person you add to the team should have some professional experience that wasn't already there. Um, and that's one of the strengths of this, this type of role. And maybe it's something we get because of some of that ambiguity. So what, uh, what bucket would you place yourself in this intersection of creativity and AI? What's the buzzword? Maybe we can come up with a buzzword right now. Oh, well, I mean, we're, so at Endure, we're talking a lot about narrative AI. Uh, yeah. It is very much a buzzword. Um, we're, we're happy. So, I so mean, we've already a, gotten into what that actually means under so the surface. When you said that, so is this something, for example, Hollywood people are yeah. talking about? Yeah. I hope so. So, so in what so what 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 uh, what sorts of narrative AI use cases have you seen? So there are a bunch out there. Um, there are some in gaming that are, are sort of poking at the edges. There well, are gamers are always have always been at the forefront of. Absolutely. And there's some really cool stuff using reinforcement learning, yeah. for example, to figure out how, you know, non-player characters should behave in games. Some pretty cool stuff on the NLP side, um, things like Replica, like a chatbot you can talk to that develops a personality over time. Um, I think there are, uh, you know, sort of, um, again, going back to Disney's Galactic Star Cruiser, they have a Siri like Star Wars, you know, AI assistant, apparently I have, I read about it. I haven't seen it yet, but um, that seems super cool. And uh, I think we are right on the edge of 
when you are, you know, really into a show, maybe you finish binging it, you should be able to explore that world in a gaming context. And that's oh, where yeah, we are going yeah. with Hidden yeah. Door. Like, that's where I see that tech. And it feels inevitable to me that this will be the way we experience the things we enjoy from an entertainment point of view in the very near future. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of fun stuff happening out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I guess, uh, uh, we sometimes forget that gaming is part of the entertainment bucket. Absolutely, and, and it's actually much bigger than much bigger than uh, the box office receipts that get generated every year, right? Yes, and I also have to say that if you're a fan of narrative games, there's a ton of great creative indie gaming work happening um, with tons of procedural systems right now. Um, games like Wildermyth, uh, where you have a little party of people going off on adventures and they're constructing comic book-like interactions dynamically, like lots of cool stuff happening. So what, uh, I'm going to just kind of uh, uh, do a rapid rapid list of uh, AI trends here. So first, okay. one is, first one is foundation models. So, so we talked about large language models. So what would you like to tell our listeners about the current limitations or, or, or how, how should people think about these large language models as they exist today? So recognizing that these are things that are trained off of a corpus that, you know, this is not a technical definition, but is essentially all of the English we can get off the internet um, and a bunch of books. And so what you end up getting in and out of these models is you know, by definition, a representation of that, and therefore the context in which we should expect them to be useful without a ton of scaffolding around them are limited to areas in which we would essentially show a person the entire internet and then want them to talk. Um, and I can't imagine a single uh, place where that would be an appropriate thing. And so what I would uh, say is, is urge extreme caution especially in putting these things unsupervised in front of actual human beings. Um, and also to understand that when we build products on top of these things, we are responsible for their output. It doesn't matter what the underlying technology was that got us to that output. We are responsible for it as if we wrote it ourselves. And so making sure that we understand that these models are at a specific level of maturity. We have, uh, in many cases, no direct insight into how we might fix them or even what fixing them would actually mean. And so that means that if you are going to use them for things to be uh, very careful about, about architecting around them in a way that, um, that you have that kind of control. Second, second area I've been fascinated with more and more is this notion of multimodal models, right? So models that take in various uh, types of data like uh, images and text and so on and so forth. So, uh, what's your sense of, uh, of how uh, easy and common they would be to use for people? I mean, uh, what's the timeline? That's a good question. I'm going to have to, this is also, to me, it's related to multitask models, which yeah. um, is one of the, those things that just blew my mind when I first started reading about, and this was several years ago, sort of realizing that training one model with multiple output functions actually gives you better performance on all of them if there's any sort of overlap in the tasks you're trying to perform, right? So thinking about multiple kinds of input in, multiple kinds of uh, questions you might ask of the essentially compressed representation of that output, it feels to me, just speaking intuitively as someone who's hung around thinking about machine learning for about 20 years, extremely promising, particularly for areas where a large, cleanish data set can be constructed. And for a set of questions where the classifications can be loose enough that we don't, you know, we're not making incredibly pivotal decisions based on what this sort of model is, is producing. Um, so if you want to tie me to some something in time, I would say this, this is on like my areas to watch closely list. Um, probably in the next couple of years, we will see something really uh, useful or a couple of applications. Um, and also lately, um, my, my sense of like predicting things in time, which I tuned at Fast Forward Labs, uh, has been like everything ends up being half the time I think it is right now. So maybe it'll be a year from now. What, uh, so responsible AI, 
it seems like uh, uh, there's a lot of awareness. Uh, and I, I actually advised the first law firm that uh, focuses on AI. And so they, they consult with chief legal counsels. And, and, uh, and one of the key takeaways they have is that, you know, people, the first place that people should start is better documentation, believe it or not. You know, because yeah. most teams most teams just deploy things without actually properly documenting. But it seems like there's a lot of reason to be hopeful, right? So because the community seems to be the level of awareness is high. I agree. I also, again, I am very much in the role of someone who builds products and have always been. Um, and also have a long track record of thinking about responsible use of systems, um, including co-authoring the data and ethics book with Mike Lukides and DJ Patil. And also at Fast Forward, every project we did had a section where we wrote about the potential ethical considerations and what we had done in the project to address those um, which I suppose is a step in the direction of documentation, like understanding what goes in, what you can expect to come out and known caveats for that is maybe step zero. We would wanna build on that. So all of that said, I am hopeful um, that the amount of awareness will drive people towards more responsible systems and more transparent use of systems or at least disclosure of what's going on. I also do feel like there's a huge gap in the world for people who are trying to build products, trying to do, do it right, um, and don't necessarily, there's no clear way to do it. And so in these areas where some things are legitimately gray, um, I feel like the community still needs to have a conversation about how we want to make the what default approaches to these sorts of problems we want to have and what we want to expect from companies and startups and uh, data scientists who are actually building these models. Um, and that's an area where I would like to see more energy um, but, and more conversation. So the good news is last month, the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, who, you know, they're, they're quite influential in, uh, in the US, but uh, probably also beyond. So, for example, their uh, their framework for cybersecurity is kind of the gold standard in cybersecurity. Right. So they start. They came out with a framework, at least for bias, that people can start taking taking a look at, and, and, cool. and as as a starting point, at least. And and oh, by the way, so to close this podcast, I should probably ask you, what are you going to talk about at the upcoming Data Plus AI <laughs> Summit? Well, I'm very excited about it. I am going to talk about um, designing products with machine learning and AI where there is no quantitative correctness, where you're designing an experience, a creative experience, and building co-creative machine learning and AI systems. So things that um, improvise with people to create something that neither would create alone. So that's so, what I'll be talking about. So actually, uh, one last question, Hillary. So this area that you just described, is are academics looking into this area as well? Absolutely. It's okay. a pretty active area of research. And uh, uh, is the academic work uh, something uh, implementable or... You know, sometimes academic work is too academic, right? It's all over the map, as with any area yeah. of academic yeah. work. Um, yeah. But there is some really nice work, particularly from younger researchers um, in the area. Very cool. And with that, thank you, Hillary. Thank you.